You know that can be us too. Amen? That can be us too. Before we dismiss the kids to junior church, we talk about a couple things here. and irritated, the other man was being generous and kind. 
He felt so bad for what had happened, but he couldn't find the other man anywhere and didn't know how to apologize. Things are not always as they appear. Sometimes we make quick assumptions about people, circumstances, and situations. We judge them, label them, and put them into a box, not recognizing that there is a much bigger picture. Sometimes we meet someone in a particular state, stage, or phase of their life and stereotype them to be a certain way. Don't be so quick to judge. You never know when you might find yourself walking in someone else's shoes. And remember, the best apology is changed behavior. Children, just miss the junior church. And there's lots of stories like that. 
you know what? God is just, he's right there in us saying, share me, share me, show me, share me. Constantly. Look at Matthew 25, 33 through 40. Matthew 25, 33 through 40. We're going to look at some verses that you've commonly looked at before, but we're going to show you something this morning that you may have missed. So powerful. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in and for naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, in as much as you did it, now listen to this. He says, and you did it to, I'm going to put in parentheses, for. And as much as you did it to, for, one of those least of these, my brethren, you did it to, for, me. Hungry, we give them food. Look at this list. If a person is thirsty, we give them water. If a person is a stranger, we take them in. Listen closely. We're going to be unappealing some things here. If, we, if a person is naked, we clothe them. If they're sick or in prison, we visit them. Most Christians see the physical, maybe you can see the physical application here. But we many times we're missing the spiritual application, the message to the redeemed. John 6, 33 through 35. John 6, 33 through 35. Now, if they are hungry, give them food. If they are thirsty, we give them water. Look at what John 6, 33 says. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Start to see it? Amen. If a person is a stranger, we take them in. Look at Colossians 1, 21 through 22. If a person is a stranger, we take them in. Look at the verse. At one time, you were strangers to God, and your minds were at war with him. Your thoughts and actions were wrong, but Christ has brought you back to God by his death on the cross, in this way, Christ can bring you to God holy and pure and without blame. That should make you weep. When we were clothed in righteousness, then Christ doesn't recognize the physical sin we were born into the flesh. Look at Genesis 2.25. And on our list, we have if a person is naked, we clothe them, right? And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. They were clothed in light. Amen. Amen. You're not, not clothed in heaven. You're going to be clothed in God's glory. You're not going to be ashamed. Nothing to be ashamed of. It's God's glory. Look at James 5, 15 through 16. James 5, 15 through 16. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Verse 16. Confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And James is here, he's insinuating that if a person is sick due to sin, the sins that cause the illness will be forgiven, and perhaps their sickness will be removed. But James was certainly noting the importance of a believing faith, and that without Christ, we're all sick. Without Christ, we're all sick. Then we have Paul and chains and shackles, writing 
Paul the saints of Philippi writing to us in Philippians 1, 21 through 25. I love this. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what will I choose? I cannot tell, he says. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a, a desire to, to be with Jesus, which is far better. He knows it's going to be far better. But nevertheless, to remain here in the flesh, it's needful for you. Us remaining here in the flesh is needful for those that don't know Christ. It's needful. Yes, many of you I've talked to them. Yeah, we're praying, praying for the rapture. Well, yeah, pray for the rapture. But you know what? Understand where you're at right now in the flesh, doing what we need to be doing. What Paul was understanding is those that need Christ, we need to get out there. We need to work it hard because it's so short what we have left. So short what we have left. And he goes on to say, verse 25, be confident of this. That's a question I'm going to ask y'all. Are you confident of this? As confident as Paul? He was a man. He was a saved man. He was redeemed. <laughs> he, was, he was. He was redeemed. And he was confident. Talking to a lady yesterday. And got different people in the different camps with taking this whole vaccine thing. Right? The mandation of it. Right? And she said, I got the holidays coming up. She said, I want to, she's probably in her mid-60s, has a son, has grandchildren. She says, I don't want to be excommunicated from visiting my family over the holidays because I'm not willing to be vaccinated. She said, I'm not willing to be vaccinated. She said, I just, I can't do that. She says, but they're, but they're scaring me into being vaccinated because then they, they, I can't see them. She says, but I'm scared to take it. And then I said, Darla, I said, you need to live by faith and not fear. But, 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 I said, stop doubting yourself. Stop doubting yourself, Christian. And I did say that. I said, stop doubting yourself, Christian. I didn't call her Darla again. I gave her Christ's name because she knew she was a daughter of the king. Don't you dare doubt anything that God has put in your heart and your, your beliefs through his holy word, which is all truth and nothing but the truth. Amen. Amen. Man, and being confident in this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and your joy of faith. Man, I like how he said that, your joy of faith. Many of us are Christians, and we're going around bumped out all the time. You got a problem. Man, where's the joy of the Lord? I don't want what you got if you're all bummed out. If I'm not saying that you're all bummed out, I'm not going to come up to you and say, hey, I see you're all happy and joyful. I want some of that. Amen. All you do is with your actions, you slam the door. You lock it when you're going around complaining, worrying, uh, blubbering, and just being good. I mean, I'm saying, where's the joy of the Lord? I'm being real with you. Because the joy of the Lord is not that. It's not the opposite. Amen? Amen. How can you witness to people if we're acting like something that doesn't, doesn't need, you just don't want, I don't want that. I don't want that. Look at James 2, 1 through 5 as we peel this back even more. James 2, 1 through 5. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, called the tempter, <laughs> and you pay attention to the, listen to this, listen to this, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and you say to him, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand here or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Yes. And you know what? This isn't necessarily saying that you're doing this in the physical sense. It's saying you're doing it in your head. 
That's why he threw that extra part in there and become judges with evil thoughts. You don't know where the, what situation the tempter was in. You don't know what situation his assistant was in. And it doesn't matter. He goes on to say, listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? And heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. So what is the true condition? True condition of our hearts. Is it all about works, absent of faith? Because when it is, it's all about me, 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 me. It is. These actions are, listen to this please, because I don't want this to be misunderstood. These actions are an amazing byproduct of an amazing living faith in an amazing God with an amazing love. That we are through faith set free to be judgment free. Judgment free of those and judgment free of me. Look at James 2.14. James 2.14 through 22. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Now follow me here, because many times this can be taken out of context. Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and any one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warm and filled. But you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does have works, is dead. But someone will say, well, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe. Amen. We've said that before. And I hear it so much. Man, and the demons tremble. They believe I'm here. But do you want to know, oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? So here James affirms that deeds or actions are the byproduct of the living faith. Works do not justify us or make us righteous before God, nor are works the means to salvation. Understand that. Our deeds are the fruit that grows from one who is obedient to God's commands and transformed by his grace. Period. Amen. Man, how can you sit there and say, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, and singing and worshiping, and then you see somebody, I'm going to hit something here too, so listen. You see somebody that's homeless, you're walking by them on the street, or, you know, we do have some green for the lake truck too. You're walking by them, and you say, you know what, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. You get down, you pray. No, you go into that store right there, they're sitting outside, you get them something they need or then they're not going to ask you most of the time. You know, you go get them something, bring them out $10, $20, whatever, and you're felt about, like, get them some food, get some water. Don't sit there saying, I'll pray that you'll, you'll get warm. Yeah. <laughs> I'll pray that you're going to be fed. <laughs> Seriously. You pray for them. After you give them some, give them some things that you show them the example of Christ. My goodness. <clears throat> Do you think getting them something is going to open up the door to Christ? It's the beginning. You might be person number 10 in the last month that got them something. And person number 11 might just be the one that gets the opportunity to lead them to Christ because they were softened through the process. 
Matthew 25, 40. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it for one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it for me. When we hear the words, least of these, in our minds, and we do, we naturally think of somebody less than us. We do. We do. We stand, I mean, we do. We naturally find ourselves better than the least. Yes? Yes. You say, it's in the wording. We naturally go there. We know that God doesn't play favorites. Amen? We know this biblically. He didn't die harder on the cross for any group of people than he did for others. He died for all. We know this. God does not respect any social status differently than another. Amen? Amen. So, does the least of these imply a value statement of a person? Or, listen, is it implying to a condition of our hearts? Amen. Ooh. Hello. Least of these just threw up a mirror right in front of you. Now you see it. Now you see it. I've missed that so many years. I mean, that's so cool. I mean, it's not cool because I'm not convicted, but it's cool. <laughs> you know, but conviction's good. That's through conviction we grow, amen? amen? Through conviction we respond. Through conviction we can motivate. Through conviction we act. I've known about Light of Life missions for 15 years. I've never been motivated to do a thing. Shame on me. Shame on me because I didn't understand that the least of these was forcing me to look at the condition of my heart. It's implying a statement, the condition of the heart. The Holy Spirit works just as hard to save a poor person as he does to save a rich person. So look at this list again that Jesus gives. Hungry, thirsty, stranger, Naked, sick, in prison? Huh. This sounds like a lost person who desperately needs Christ. What do you think? This sounds like a lost person who desperately needs you to share Christ with them. And yet how many times, how many times are we a James 2.16 person? James 2.16, and one of you said to them, be part of peace, be warm, filled. That's a James 2.16 person. You don't give them anything. Needed for the body or for the spirit. I said it before, and it so fits here real well and perfect. The spirit lives so close the body that they catch each other's diseases. So as we assess our condition on this matter of ministering to the least of those without physical sustenance and the least of those without spiritual sustenance, that can be one of the same, of course. Let me show you something real interesting here because for, what, over a month and a half we've been talking end time stuff on Wednesdays, and I encourage you to come out on Wednesday at 6.30. You will be blessed by my brother Ed passionately sharing end times stuff with you that I guarantee you don't know. He has a teaser. Oh, he does have a teaser. Oh, you know what? Go ahead and run that teaser now, and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap things up.
Yeah. I had no idea. I didn't know what it was going to say. All I know is, with what you just heard previous to everything I said this morning, and what it's going to wrap up with, ties right in. Because that's how the Holy Spirit works. Wow. So we saw that we were in the end of Matthew 25, of how Jesus is telling us that whatever we do or don't do for the one that is lacking physically or spiritually, that is what we do for him, to him, for him, right? But, I'm following here, wrapping up, wrapping up. I want you to see this. Don't want you to miss this, please. Especially after that. Right before, right before we get into Jesus teaching this at the end of Matthew 25, as we work backwards through the chapter, we see in verses 31 through 46, the Son of Man will judge the nations, working backwards, Matthew 25, 14 through 30. We see the parable of the talents, working backwards, and then Matthew 1, Matthew 25, 1 through 13. The parable of the five wise and the five foolish bridesmaids that we just talked about last Wednesday. This is right before everything you just heard right now about the condition of your heart. Then we get right into the last couple of verses of Matthew 24, right before we go into 25. Matthew 24, 50 through 51. And I'm going to wrap up with this. The master of that servant, which is really the king spoken of in Matthew 25, will come on a day when he is not looking for him, and at an hour that he is not aware of, and will cut him in two and appoint his portion with the hypocrites. That's not a good place to be. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's not game time, church. Amen? We're not playing games anymore. I had a lot of you come to me in the past year, and you said, you know what? God has just spoken to me, and I'm done. I'm done playing games. I'm done playing church. I'm done playing games. I'm starting to see God's word. Hey, what's really cool? I could be up here and just preaching and tearing it up. It doesn't mean nothing until the Holy Spirit breaks through. Amen. It doesn't mean a thing. And man, when you guys come to me, and I'm saying, I'm hearing your testimony of how the Holy Spirit broke through. That's the blessing coming full circle. Yes. That's the blessing coming full circle. So as we reflect upon our, our actions and or our inactions toward the least of these, now we understand it's not what we thought. I mean, yes, that's part of it, but that's the faith and works things that James talks about. We can do better. We can do better, amen? We can do better as individuals. We can do better as families. We can do better as husbands. We can do better as wives. We can do better for our Lord. There's so much we can do. No, we can't outpray the Lord. We can't operate, and we never will, but we need to be on our knees. And it's not necessarily physically. You know, being on your knees physically is a powerful thing to be. You know, Wednesday nights we're praying, and there's a number of people that are getting down on their knees. It's a great place to be. It's a humbling position. Amen? Amen. It's a humbling position. And I'd encourage everybody, I'm going to start going a little more often. If, you know, when we pray, if you, if you are physically able, get down on your knees. Let's get humble before our Lord. He deserves that. You know what? He doesn't need it. He deserves it. Yes. Man, does he deserve it? Amen. And he understands if you're not physically able. I mean, that's a good amount of grace. Amen. Let's stand this morning. Let's stand this morning. So he said. You do these things.
the least of them. Share me of the bread. Share me of the water. Share me. I, God says, will get them out of their shackles. I will get them out of their sickness of not knowing me.